All right. As you may have seen, the Secretary General spoke at the Human Rights Council um, in Geneva, uh, saying that he would that he came there to launch a call for action. He added that he's decided to do it now during the 75th anniversary of the United Nations because of the centrality of human rights in all of the UN's work and because human rights are under assault. The Secretary General said all our societies have benefited from human rights movements led by women, young people, minorities, indigenous people, and others. Our call to action, he said, singles out seven areas where concerted effort can achieve a quantum leap in the progress or avert the risk of backsliding. And that speech has been distributed to you. Uh, following his remarks at the Human Rights uh, Council, the Secretary General visited the World Health Organization's Crisis Center, met with the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, and he also spoke to reporters. He praised WHO colleagues for their courage and dedication, noting he saw firsthand how their work to fight Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo helped save many lives. In the COVID-19 outbreak, he also commended WHO for its work to contain the epidemic. He appealed for all countries to assume their responsibilities and to do everything to be prepared to contain the disease, reiterating that this is possible. He appealed for donors to support WHO's funding appeals. If there's truly something stupid to do, it is to not fully fund WHO appeals, the Secretary General said, because WHO appeals are vital to support member states to avoid these tragic diseases become truly global nightmares. Uh, we'll share a transcript of his remarks shortly. And earlier in the day, during his daily update, WHO's Director General, Dr. Tedros, said he is concerned by the sudden increase of cases in Italy, Iran, as well as the Republic of Korea. However, he added, this does not mean the epidemic has become a pandemic. He reiterated his call for all countries to, and, and communities to focus on preparing and protecting health workers, people who are most at risk of severe disease, as well as countries that are the most vulnerable. And the Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohammed <clears throat> spoke at the opening of the special session of the Regional Coordination Mechanism for Africa, and that took place in Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. She said the significance of the African Union as a strategic partner to the United Nations cannot be overstated. The Deputy Secretary General told participants that like the rest of the world, Africa is not on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 and the goals of Agenda 2063. While Africa has made notable progress in education, health, and other so social outcomes, she said this is the pace of poverty reduction is slow and inclusive growth, leaving no one behind, remains elusive. Adding that there is no better example of a strong partnership around an SDG solution than the African Union's initiative on silencing the guns. Her remarks have been shared with you. Senior personnel appointment today to share with you. Secretary General is appointing Major General Ishwar Hamal of Nepal as the head of the mission and force commander of the UN Disengagement Observer Force, otherwise known as UNDOF. Uh, Major General Hamal succeeds Major General Karel, also of Nepal, who served as the acting head of mission and force commander from June to October of 2019. The Secretary General thanks Major Karel for his dedicated service during this challenging period. Uh, Major General Hamal has a long career in the Nepali Army since entering as an artillery officer in 1983, and he's had extensive experience with UN peacekeeping. His, his and bio is available to you. Back here, Nikolai Mladenov, the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, briefed the Security Council this morning by VTC, and he warned that more than 60 rockets have been fired into Israel since last night by Palestinian Islamic Jihad. While well, Israel has mounted attacks on Islamic Jihad forces, Mr. Mladenov called for an immediate stop to the firing of rockets and mortars, which he said would only risk dragging Gaza into other, another destructive round of hostilities with no end in sight. He added that women increasingly bear the brunt of the dire humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip and also highlighted what he called the ongoing health disaster in Gaza, where stock levels of 46% of essential medicines have been completely depleted. 
And on Friday evening, you saw that we issued a statement on Afghanistan in which the Secretary General welcomed the announcement of nationwide reduction of violence in, in the country. He said it hoped that this critical step will lead to intra-Afghan negotiations and a comprehensive peace process. And over the weekend, the mission, uh, the UN mission in the country released a report which says that the parties to the conflict in the country killed and injured more than 10,000 civilians in 2019. This is the sixth year in a row that the number of civilian casualties exceeded 10,000. In addition, the UN found that in 2019, the number of civilian casualties has surpassed, has surpassed 100,000. That report is, was available to you. And also on Saturday, we issued a statement in which the Secretary General welcomed the establishment of the transitional government of national unity in South Sudan. He commended the parties for the significant achievement and applauded regional and international efforts that contributed to the result. He also called on members of the transitional government to fully follow the letter and spirit of the agreement so that the people of South Sudan can finally realize the benefits of a durable peace and stability. And lastly, I want to say thank you to our friends in Tarawa for full payment of the 2020 regular budget. Tarawa is the capital of which member state? Kiribati. There you go. You, exactly. Uh, we all learned something today. Edie and then Maggie. Excuse me? I, we, we all did. I did, for sure. Yeah. Um, on Syria, the situation in Idlib has worsened every day. Can you tell us what the Secretary General has done in the past three days to try and talk to the leaders of Russia, Turkey, Syria, to try and come up with some kind of a ceasefire arrangement? Uh, I think, as the Secretary General told you on Friday, he had been uh, – passing on message privately uh, and uh, and publicly. Uh, he had met with a number of PRs last week, and this evening he is scheduled to meet with Foreign Minister Lavrov in Geneva. Uh, and he's also being uh, fully briefed. Uh, he's meeting uh, his envoy, Mr. Pedersen, who will brief him on his contacts that have been uh, had, as Mr. Pedersen has also been passing the same message of the need for de-escalation and cessation of hostilities. In Geneva, yes, in Geneva. And Mr. Lavrov in a few hours, also in Geneva. Maggie. Steph, in about two weeks, the CSW is going to kick off. Mm -hmm. And uh, amid this whole COVID-19 situation, mm -hmm. uh, we're having delegates and participants coming from ev every corner mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. So what's the UN doing at headquarters to prepare? And uh, are you working with New York City health authorities also because it w would affect everybody? Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good question. We've, uh, I was asking this morning to see if there had been any impact on, on registration. So we're still trying to find that out. Obviously, it is the responsibility of the host uh, government uh, to ensure uh, the proper, uh, that the proper policies and screening are, uh, are in place. We are uh, asking people to follow the recommendations of, uh, of WHO, notably on issues of personal hygiene, on washing hands, uh, and so forth. Uh, but it's a bit too early to tell if it has had an impact, or if it will have an impact on the number of delegates uh, that we expect to see here. Follow up. Um but you're having several thousand people come, mm -hmm. which in a way you're putting a strain on the New York City authorities with that. You're mm -hmm. giving them the extra burden and you're saying it's their responsibility, the host Well, the, sc countries. the screening, the, obviously the health screening is, uh, is the responsibility of the, host, uh, of the host country. We will take uh, whatever measures we can here. I mean, I think you've, you're, you're probably seeing the extra, the addition of extra hand sanitizers uh, around the building. And it's important that people also take the proper precautions. Well, but wait, so, sorry. I know Sherwin's <laughs> jumping out of his seat here. Um, <laughs> sure, we, sure we can be strong. But are you, yes or no, are you working with the New York City authorities at all? Uh, I'm sure. I, I will check, but I have no doubt that we're in touch with the New York City authorities. But I will get back to you on that. All right. Okay. Sherwin, yeah. there's, 
we understand that there's a task force that meets three times a week. What does this task force discuss here at the United Nations as uh, in response to this, the spread of the coronavirus? The sense I get from your podium is that there's a lot of congratulations g going to the WHO in terms of how they've managed the response to this, and yet we're seeing the number of cases continue to spike, the number of deaths continue to spike in new territories like Iran and South Korea mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Italy. So why, why this backslapping when people are dying and, and the, the, I, I don't the think, numbers are I, I don't think increasing? It's, uh, a, I don't think it's backslapping. Uh, I also think the, the WHO, led by Mr. Tedros, is doing whatever they can to help national authorities uh, deal uh, with the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, obviously, the national authorities are the ultimate authorities or in the lead on these systems. Uh, WHO is working very closely with countries that are especially vulnerable, where their health systems may be, uh, may be a bit weaker. What is also important, I think as the Secretary General said, is that the funding appeals for WHO to help uh, uh, contain uh, the spread of the virus as much as possible, especially uh, when you are looking at uh, at developing countries where, again, the the the, the existing health systems uh, may be more vulnerable is so important. Uh, Evelyn. Yes, to follow up on Maggie's question, it's uh, I wonder if all these women are going to get visas, not because of the virus, but because. Some of them come from countries well, that's, that that's Mr. A, Trump doesn't that's, like. That's a separate issue. We very yes, much exactly. hope, we, we very much hope uh, that the host country authorities uh, will grant visas uh, according to uh, the requirements under the um, the host country uh, agreements uh, to delegates attending uh, UN conferences, including especially the the CSW that's coming up. I mean, has, has the U.S. mission been involved in this, or you don't know? Well, I mean, the yeah. U.S. mission, the U.S. authorities are the ones granting the visas. Yeah. We're, we're not the ones uh, the ones doing it. I think it's a little early to tell right, right. now okay. uh, if there's been any impact on the number Another of Another question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, UNRWA, uh, Mr. Mladenov mentioned UNRWA mm -hmm. and that it was short of money. Do you have any further details on how short they are and... No, we can uh, get uh, some uh, hard data from Anwar. Yeah. Okay. okay. Senor. So could you give us an update of the work uh, that Mr. Arno is doing in, in Bolivia and if the tell us if the Secretary General is concerned with the elections coming up and there has been a lot of messages from different uh, parts questioning that these elections are going to be free and fair, et cetera? Thank you. Well, you know, we, uh, in terms of, uh, of the elections, uh, notably on, um, we have, uh, we are providing technical assistance to the Supreme uh, Electoral Tribunal. Um, the Supreme Tribunal and the UN have also signed an agreement for a project to assist um, the the tribunal and the department uh, departmental electoral courts in delivering credible and inclusive electoral process. Uh, the electoral assistance is part of, the, of a of a broader uh, plan, a broader support uh, by the UN uh, to consolidate uh, peace and political calm in Bolivia. Mr. Alno is continuing uh, his work and his efforts as well. Just to follow up, I. Um I believe up to a third of the candidacies that were um, put forward have been uh, not approved by the uh, electoral authorities, I think the, this high tribunal. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Well, I think sir? what's important is that people should have a right uh, to appeal to the relevant uh, institutions if they believe their rights have not been respected by the decisions taken uh, regarding their participation in the election. Maggie? On South Sudan, uh, what does the UN see as being the next steps now that we've gotten to the transitional, through the transitional? Well, I think the, the important step is to consolidate uh, and to follow what was agreed upon, uh, is that the, the, the leaders put into action the agreement they have signed on to, 
there's a lot of work to be done uh, in South Sudan. There's a lot of peace to consolidate. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work to be done in alleviating the suffering of the South Sudanese people who have suffered not only because of war but also of uh, natural uh, natural disasters. So it's important, first of all, that the two leaders themselves follow the spirit uh, and the letter of the agreement, and it's important that the international community and the regional institutions also support the government. And speaking of, speaking of nat nat natural disasters, do you have any update on the locusts? No, uh, not today. We hope to have something tomorrow. Thank you all, and see you tomorrow.